Hasta Sacramento, hasta Sacramento, mis derechos a pelear. Welcome everyone to teaching about Dolores Huerta and the United Farm Workers with primary sources from the Library of Congress. We're really happy to start this webinar with you this afternoon or this evening, depending on where you are. As you all are introducing yourselves, um, we'll introduce ourselves too. My name is Sarah Badawi. I'm with the Constitutional Rights Foundation here in Los Angeles. And I'm Carrie Doggett. I'm with Constitutional Rights Foundation, also known as CRF, here in Los Angeles. And hi, I'm Julie Schall. I'm with the Barrett Education Foundation, and I'm uh, chiming in from Chicago, Illinois. I'm going to give you just a really brief overview of the project, and if you haven't introduced yourself, please feel free to continue in the chat. Um, we love an active chat, so keep it going throughout. We'll answer questions along the way as well. Um, we're really excited here at Constitutional Rights Foundation to have the opportunity to work with Barra Education Foundation in Chicago and DePaul University under a grant from the Library of Congress's Teaching with Primary Sources program. And the idea here is that we are going to try to inject a little bit of civic learning into all four of the core disciplines, history, social studies, English language arts, math, and science. And <clears throat> We define civic learning rather broadly. In other words, we're not talking about just content, you know, civics, traditional civics content of constitution and voting and elections. We're, we're defining it more broadly in that we're talking about really um, using research-based practices to help students develop skills and dispositions um, of effective and engaged citizenship. Those things uh, involve critical thinking skills, collaboration, problem solving, caring about issues, knowing how to access current events and, and uh, these sorts of things, and to care, to care about issues and, and want to try to, to address issues that matter to them. For social studies teachers, the C3 framework might be familiar, uh, college, career, and civic life. And all of the lessons and activities that we have developed under this project are C3 compliant. They are aligned. And you'll see that in the lessons. And by the way, like I said, you are going to have access to the lessons right after this webinar. We're going to give you a link and you can go download them um, right away. So just quickly, today's webinar, what we're going to do, we're going to do this in 40 minutes, 45 minutes or less. We're going to walk you through a lesson focused on Dolores Huerta. Um, and we originally designed this lesson for English language arts, but we then thought, well, social studies teachers are going to really like this lesson too. And so we have an activity embedded in the lesson that is for English language arts, kind of down that pathway, and another one more down the social studies pathway. The lesson comes in three three levels, elementary, middle, and high school. And we'll talk about the differences of those, but keep in mind that that's also a way to scaffold this lesson in your classroom, should you have um, a lot of different kinds of learners in one classroom that you need to kind of differentiate for. Today, we're gonna to use the middle school version, and like I said at the end of the webinar, we'll let you know the differences between the elementary, the middle, and the high school level. So I'm just going to jump right in and uh, tell you about the lesson objectives for the lesson that we're working through today. Like Carrie said, that's the middle school level lesson. Our goal is that as a result of this lesson that students will be able to describe conditions facing farm workers and how people organized to change them. Um, that they'll be able to define relevant vocabulary in context using terms like coalition, union, strike, and boycott. Students will explore the contributions of Dolores Huerta to the farm workers' struggle for justice and draw connections between Dolores Huerta's work and their own 
ability to work with others to address problems facing their communities and or society. So those are the goals for the lesson. The way the lesson is set up is it kind of starts out with a brief discussion with the whole class, um, beginning to introduce these ideas of working together to solve a problem. It um, introduces the kids to some key terminology, words like coalition and labor union, and then pretty quickly moves into an initial primary source analysis, which Julie is going to walk you through right now. The exciting fun part. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, so um, we're going to start off talking a little bit about inquiry, um, which we, you know, is is all over the place, but I'd like to start out a little bit to get an idea of where you're coming from and um, type in the chat a phrase or quick sentence about what, what you think inquiry is. So again, it can just be a quick bullet point, a little chat, discovery, this is about asking questions, questioning, researching the answer to a question, collaboration, brainstorming, student solving a problem, investigating, answering questions. Great. So I think um, just great exploring topic in a critical way. Um, absolutely. So one of the things, um, kind of just to give you an idea of where the Library of Congress kind of thinking thinks about inquiry, especially within regards to primary source learning, is that inquiry is really a process of active learning that is driven by questioning and critical thinking. So very similar to what you say. So the next question I'd like you to kind of answer here in the chat box is why you use inquiry? What, what's, what's, what's behind it? What do you see in your classrooms? Why is it beneficial? How does it help you? How does it help engage your students? Student buy-in and engagement. See how much students know. They dig deeper as well as personalize it. Wow, you guys are going so fast, I can't even speak that quickly. <laughs> Activating students' prior knowledge, taking ownership of information, engagement and understanding, motivated, problem solving, great. I think um, you guys are all kind of touching on some of what the, the library thinks of it as, as well is that the understandings that students develop through inquiry are deeper and longer lasting than kind of prepackaged knowledge that that uh, someone is going to deliver to you, right? Because you're engaged in, in the process yourself. So a little bit um, just to kind of, again, make sure we're all on the same page about thinking about primary sources and inquiry. Um, is that they really, primary sources, engage students in that process, um, transforming it by provoking students to question, make inter inferences, interpret different points of view, use critical thinking skills to analyze and evaluate, draw conclusions, and pull together disparate pieces of evidence to think conceptually. So those are all skills that um, you will see represented in the C3 and things like Common Core, but they're really also real life skills, right? These are all things that you're gonna need to do if you're going to be an engaged and active citizen. You need to think about, um, be able to have all those skills. So primary sources are a great way to help students build those skills. Um, they also, engage students emotionally and personally because they represent authentic voices and perspectives. And they don't just tell one story, but they tell a lot of different stories and that helps students see the complexity of issues and recognize the importance of context for credible interpretation. Um, and especially, right, that recognizing that there are different sides and there's more than one way of seeing it, I think is really valuable. Um, for the future to be able to engage in um, civil and civic discourse. So one um, way that the library has come up with this tool, they call the primary source analysis tool, to really help uh, start with the process of analyzing a primary source. Um, so basically, uh, the library provides what you see up here is a PDF that you can um, download and print out. They also have an online version um, that you can use and actually has drop down menus with guiding questions. But 
basically we've got the three main sections. So um, observe, I see, reflect, I think or I feel. Um, and, and in particular, I think or I feel about what I see. And question, what do I wonder about? Um, so these allow students to look to the source for information and details, right, in the observe section. Then connect what they see or maybe read or hear, depending on the source, to what they know um, in the reflect column and develop questions about their observations and reflections. Um, finally, you'll see at the bottom, there's a further investigation box. Um, and that can be used too when you're working um, with students to kind of gather up um, certain key questions that you might be um, guiding students to look into further. So just to, one other thing to note um, is that even though there is in three columns, it's not necessarily a linear, linear process. You can jump back and forth. But in the reflect, when someone says that, you really wanna push them to go back to the source and pick out specific details, um, just like you would with a regular text, right? To say, what's the evidence? Why, I think that because I can point to this in there. Um, so, this is kind of what we'll be doing a little bit of to give you a flavor of um, one of the, some of the images that we use in, in this lesson. And so we'll take a look and ask you to make some observations, reflections, and, and questions. All right, here, so if you can use the chat box um, to take a look at this image and note some observations that you make, um, point out what things you think or feel based on those observations, as well as any questions that you might have. So, and as Carrie mentioned, um, within the lesson, um, there are suggestions. There's a scaffolded tool, so with some questions already provided for you or some things, prompts for them to use, but um, it really depends, right, um, on where your students are starting from, how much modeling and uh, that they need. So backbreaking work, hard labor, right? So maybe because they're stooping over to work, that's what I see makes me think of that. Um, it's possibly hot. So again, like pointing to why, why do you think it is? What do you see in there? Um, it looks like they're, they're picking crops, difficult conditions. Um, and again, some of the things that might point to that is the way that they're hunched over, um, safety issues. So again, pointing to specifics in there that, that you might think that, that you can see. Um, so once you do that and get, the, again, getting the kids really engaged in that, um, then you can then go and show them some bibliographic information. So here we have, find out a little bit more. We, we find out that they're pea pickers, their wages are one cent per pound, um, and a hamper holds um, about 28 pounds. We know it's in Imperial, California, um, which is near the, the kind of borders between uh, Mexico, California, and Arizona. Right, so already now you're, you're already interested, engaged, you've got some information, you're already feeling empathetic, um, which is a really great thing that uh, primary sources can do. Um, so I'll have you take a look at the next image. Um, so again, here we have another one. Um, you can kind of see similar terrain, um, different, slightly different context, but definitely um, still in the same, same vein. So if we take a look at the bibliographic information here, we see that we're in the same place. Oops, sorry about that. Um, but this time it's cantaloupes. We get some extra information about the time of day. Um, again, shows you kind of how long that is. Okay. And then we'll go on to the next image. And this one here, um, we've got some other information. So instead of outside, we're inside. So what, what other information do you glean from this? What do you see? 
housing conditions, right? Um, and and what details kind of give you a sense of of what that is? Crowded, absolutely. You can see there's a lot of stuff in it right next to each other. Basic living conditions, right? There's no dresser um, or closet that you can see of. Sparse living conditions. The windows open, so that means, means you think that there's maybe no cooling or heat heating system, right? So here, this is, you find out that this is an interior of a house rented to Mexican workers um, actually in Michigan, Saginaw County. Um, and so you're getting an idea here of not only their conditions, of what they were working in outside, but inside. And so this part of the, the lesson here then gives you that where the, the, the kids are taking charge, they're making observations and reflections and asking questions and getting in. And it really helps set up the broad sweep of history that led to the fight for rights for farm workers. So they really under, get a better understanding of what life was like and how that evolved over time. One resource that you'll find in the lesson plans um, is just a supplemental activity to help you build some more context for your students. Once they've had a chance to look at these primary sources, which we hope will grab their attention and pique their curiosity about living and working conditions of farm, farm workers, these were back in the 30s. The, um, some clips in this documentary film um, show conditions living and working conditions of farm workers in the 60s around the time that Dolores Huerta and the United Farm Workers were beginning to organize uh, farm workers here in California. So that resource is in the, in the lesson plan as well. Um, going back to the lesson plan and just kind of giving you a little bit more an idea of, of what to expect in it. Um, so once the kids have had a chance to, to look at these primary sources and, and maybe take a look at, um, at this film clip, now at this point in the lesson, you'll introduce them to Dolores Huerta and the United Farm Workers. Um, there's a, some opportunity in the lesson to just kind of talk with the kids a little bit about how workers might have tried to ask for better working conditions, given what they've seen in the pictures. To, describe, uh, to define some important terms like the word strike, which they will learn um, in Spanish is huelga, and we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, they'll also look at some photos on this theme, some more photos about related to striking specifically, um, including one of Dolores Huerta during the Delano Grape Strike. Um, and then they'll get a quick background on the origin and founding of United Farm Workers. So one of the photos that they'll see, for example, is another Dorothea Lang photo here from 1938 um, of some early attempts at union organizing. And then this is a very famous photo from during the Delano Great Strike of Dolores Huerta. Um, this is why the kids need to learn the word, that the word huelga in Spanish means strike. Um, and we'll come back to this as, as a cool part of the lesson um, shortly. Um, one thing just to mention is that it, it was, um, yeah, well, sorry, we'll come back to this in a second. Um, so then the kids, you've got some background in the lesson about the, the uh, formation of the United Farm Workers, that it actually came out of the combination of the National Farm Workers Association, which had been founded by Dolores Huerta and Cesar Chavez, but that they had joined with Filipino Agricultural Workers Organizing Committee um, during the Delano Grape Strike, and that it was these two organizations coming together that created the United Farm Workers, who we still hear about today. And one of the things that I really like about um, the way this lesson is constructed, and by the way, Sarah wrote it, is, um, is for high school teachers, you probably are gonna go further into labor, uh, unions, strikes, uh, workers' rights, and particularly the United Farm Workers and that piece of, of American history. Um, but like elementary teachers, you might go down the path of where food comes from, or jobs, and things like that. And middle school, 
you might, with your curriculum, go more down more of a cultural path. And so think about you know, the different avenues you can take that link this lesson back to the curriculum that you're teaching, whether you're social studies or ELA, what literature are you using, what themes are in the literature that, that have parallels <clears throat> or can be analogies to the, this content. Absolutely. Um, and then once you've had a look at sort of these different sources, you've met some of these important cast of characters and, and the, learned a little bit about the organizations, then students look at another primary source from the Library of Congress, which is House Resolution 37, which expressed the sense of the House of Representatives that all workers deserve fair treatment and safe working conditions, and honoring the Lotus Huerta for her commitment to the improvement of working conditions for farm worker families and the rights of women and children. Um, so this, um, you know, at this point in the lesson, you can kind of explain again, depending on the level that you're teaching, how much depth you want to go into, but explain, you know, what a House or a Senate resolution is. Um, the lesson it tells you a little bit about sort of where this one came from and, and what happened to it. Um, the document itself, it's a little bit longer and there's, you know, there's more text in it, obviously, than in those photos, but it provides a really nice biography of the Lotus Huerta. So that's partly why we included it in here as well, is just because it's a great, um, sort of snapshot of, of her life and of, of some of her most important contributions. Um, then at this point in the lesson, you can take just a short time to show this 30 second video clip from a film that came out last year called Dolores. Um, the link I'm going to show you now is on Facebook, so you may not be able to access it at school. They had passed a law in Arizona that if you said strike, you could go to jail for six months, or if you said boycott, you could go to jail for six months. And so we were trying to overturn that law. Uh, Cesar Chavez was doing a fast, and we were trying to organize people to come and, and support that. And when I went to try to organize a group of Latino professionals, and they said, no, in Arizona, you can't do that. Only in California. In Arizona, no se puede. No, you can't. And my response to, to them was, Si se puede in Arizona, and that's where the phrase was born. So showing a clip like that can give the kids a great chance to sort of see, um, you know, that Dolores Huerta is still alive, that this is what she sounds like now, that this is, um, you know, that this is how she remembers these, these important events. Um, like Carrie mentioned early on, we're doing, the lesson we're walking you through more step-by-step -step today is the middle school lesson. But I'm going to tell you a little bit now about how we've differentiated this for different grade spans. Um, at the elementary school level, there's a pretty simple writing assignment, um, just a two paragraph uh, writing assignment um, for, for the elementary school lesson. It, at the middle school level and, and the high school level, we bring in this poem. Um, and this poem is called Wedga. It's written by a poet named Diana Garcia, who um, one of the links provided in the lesson is to her reading this poem at an event that was hosted at the Library of Congress. The poem Huelga is inspired by the photo that we showed you before of Dolores Huerta, which was included in an exhibit at the National Portrait Gallery and, and was the, the reason for the celebration at the Library of Congress where Diana Garcia wrote this poem. And so, um, and Diana Garcia's own history is, is really relevant here. She was born in a migrant farm labor camp in the San Joaquin Valley here in uh, California, and is now a professor of creative writing at Cal State University, Monterey Bay. So that's a little context of the poem. So in this activity, uh, which is included as an optional extension for elementary, by the way, um, middle school or high school students would read and watch Diana Garcia reading this poem, and then middle school students have the chance to write a poem. Um, and middle, uh, sorry, and high school students could then write a poem or a speech or a letter to the editor, building on the themes introduced in the lesson. In addition, as an alternative or extra writing assignment, and this is the one that Carrie mentioned has a little bit more of a social studies bent for those of you who are social studies teachers, students can write a letter to Congress recommending recognition of an individual by 
a House or Senate resolution. So this is a chance for them to do some persuasive writing to their representative and or senators, calling on them to recognize someone in the same way that Congresswoman Hinda Solis did with this resolution that she introduced about the Lotus Huerta back in 2007. Um, and then finally in the lessons, the and again, this depends on you and your students, um, they have the opportunity to share their written work with their classmates. <clears throat> First, are there any, if you have questions, post them in the, the chat. One question that I would imagine might be on your mind is how long does this lesson take? Um, teachers who have already piloted the lesson say it took two class periods unless they decided to really extend. Um, some teachers want to save up and do this around <clears throat> Cesar Chavez Day, which I think is in March. Is in March. Um, so <clears throat> that's what we're hearing so far from folks who have piloted. Now, speaking of piloting the lesson, <clears throat> if you would like to pilot this lesson with at least one class of students um, and complete a survey about the pilot, you could receive a $100 stipend. And we have funding right now for five folks to do this. And <clears throat> the way that you volunteer to do it is you're going, we're going to ask you in a minute here to take a flash survey about this webinar, how valuable was it? And we swear the survey is like, it'll take you 30 seconds to do. And that information is helpful to us as we plan um, upcoming webinars. If you take the flash survey for the webinar, you're automatically entered to win a $50 gift card, and we'll be doing a drawing for that tomorrow. <clears throat> so you don't even have to wait to know if you're a winner. <clears throat> and the first five people who check on that survey, yes, I would like to pilot, and it will be timestamped, um, will contact you via email and set it up. And you know, don't hesitate to volunteer though, because someone may volunteer and then they see the whole lesson and they're like, yeah, not what I thought it would be. And so we'll just keep going down the volunteer list until we have five who really, really want to do it. Um, but also, <clears throat> there's also going to be some raffles going on too. Because on, there we go. So you can find these and other civics primary source lessons on a website, a new website that's about to be launched. It's called Citizen U. Citizen U is also going to be hosting some special raffles with prizes, ways to pilot the lesson down the line. And so as Citizen U becomes live and launched, we're going to be emailing all of you um, with a link so that you can go there. Meanwhile, these lessons are posted right now on the CRF website. The link is there. We're going to email you that link, and I will cut and paste it into the chat section along with the link to the um, flash survey. So here's the link to the flash survey, and here comes the link to the lessons, which you can get right now. And again, we're going to be sending you information about the Citizen U website and all the fun things that that is going to offer to teachers around the country. And we'll continue to post lessons on the CRF website, right where you're going to see them there. We haven't done anything fancy to that page yet. It's kind of utilitarian right now, so that you can just access the lessons. And we'll be adding bells and whistles to it as we go. And with that, if there's nothing else, we did, we did it kind of faster. Um, we really thank you all for joining. Sarah, look for an email from Sarah at crf-usa.org because she is going to be the one who's contacting folks who want to pilot and contacting the winner of our $50 raffle. And I'll also be sending out tomorrow, um, once we get it downloaded and, and everything, we'll all send you the, um, the link to the recording of this webinar um, if you want to share it or watch it again. Um, and then, um, and I'll also send you the, the links to the lessons, like, like Carrie said. And with that, we say thank you and good night. We will hang out five more minutes or so in case you have questions you want to ask us that 
that we can help you with. And again, thank you. Thanks so much for taking the time. We hey. know it's tough in the middle of the week. And thank you, Julie Shaw. Applause for Julie. Uh, Great, Julie. Thanks. Thanks, Carrie. Thanks, Sarah. We're really excited about, about this and can't wait to hear back from you all and, and on how it goes and, and what you think. Absolutely. Please keep us posted.